uh, good morning. I think I should give you a round of applause for um, showing up today, uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. That's dedication. Uh, so well done as well. Um, so yes, so I'm Guillaume. I've uh, been building recommended systems uh, in a few companies in the past three years using uh, really leveraging the, the Python ecosystem. So also I'm very thankful for well, the, um, the PyData, the non-focus organization for providing these uh, amazing libraries that I've used on uh, my daily, daily job and that I really uh, love using. I've also using, uh, been using Scala, uh, built on top of, uh, well, building recommender systems on top of Spark, which is also an open source project. And that's also an amazing piece of software. So big, big thank to uh, people and open source software development in general and people involved in these projects. And today I'll be uh, talking about uh, how uh, how the, the surge of deep learning frameworks uh, such as TensorFlow, but uh, there's also Torch, PyTorch, uh, Theano, have been a, a kind of a game changer in the way I, uh, I work and in the way we build recommender systems. And um, to be honest, when TensorFlow was released a year and a half ago, uh, there was a bit of, for me it wasn't clear uh, whether it was specific to uh, image recognition so really building and training deep neural networks with the convolutional layers. And I thought it was restricted to this use case. And this is because, well, that's where the biggest gain uh, appeared using uh, deep learning. But then actually looking intently at uh, TensorFlow logo, I realized I could actually just use TensorFlow or any of the deep learning framework as a kind of machine learning generic library and that my favorite um, algorithm, which is matrix factorization, very used in, in recommender systems, could actually be, um, uh, be defined and trained using, using these deep learning uh, frameworks that are just kind of extension of NumPy, for example, but with the ability to run on the GPU and the ability to benefit from a symbolic uh, differentiation or, or auto differentiation that I will cover later on. But before, I would like just to give a quick recap on uh, recommender systems, because you might not all be uh, familiar with this field. So the field, which is also an academic field with uh, conferences such as Rexis and, and academic papers, has kind of came to popularity in 2008 with the, the Netflix prize, when Netflix open sourced a data set of, his, of its users uh, rating movies, and they um, started a contest asking the community to come up with the alternatives to beat their internal baseline to predict what a user, what rating a user will give to a, a, a movie he or she hasn't seen yet. Um, so after this contest, uh, actually, the focus has moved from explicit ratings, so people telling what, how do I like this movie, to implicit feedbacks, such as people viewing items or content on a, on a generic website, or people clicking or not clicking on a recommendation displayed on a widget on the site. And it's been used throughout the, the web industry. So Amazon, Spotify, YouTube, Criteo for computational advertisement are the, the main uh, companies that the main visible companies using recommender systems. My company as well, which is a worldwide group owning a variety of marketplaces and media houses, uh, recommender system is a key part of our, the way we keep engaged with the users and the way we well, generate more engagement and more, more clicks and more revenue ultimately. Um, just briefly, so the problem of recommender systems is to, is can be boiled down as matrix completion. So we represent users as rows of this big matrix, and items or content as columns. And sometimes we have already observed what's the feedback of the user with the content, and sometimes we haven't. And the goal is to complete, to fill in the gaps. So in this particular example, what's the value of the, the blue cell based on the neighborhood, the, the, the ratings of similar or users and similar items. And the key assumption of the, the most popular method, which is matrix factorization, is to say that we can dramatically reduce the dimensionality of this matrix, this huge user item matrix, and we can kind of compress users 
and items in a shared latent space where the model says that the rating of a user with, for an item is actually the cross product of the representation of the user and the item in the, the shared latent space. On the terminology, um, recommended systems and matrix factorization, we use the term factors for the, these vectors representing users or items. In the neural network um, community, it's named as embeddings, and that's really interchange interchangeable uh, name. This is exactly the same thing. It's just a dense representation of, a, uh, of, a, of an entity into a um, latent space. So a space that is not directly attached to the, to the features, to the input features. So you let the algorithm decide how we should split, the, how we should map yourself into this representational space of often 10 to 100 or 1,000 dimensions, depending on the domain. domain. The kind of state-of-the-art method uh, for many years has been this article. It has two strong points. First of all, it's able to deal with implicit interactions. I don't know if I can point, but uh, you see that the PUI is not a rating. It's just a implicit feedback. So it could be a click, it could be a non-click, it could be a view, it could be you haven't viewed the, the item. And you can attach various levels of confidence to this, uh, to this interaction, which is the CUI part. So it's still root mean squared error based, so trying to minimize some kind of, um, uh, it's not a classification, it's trying to minimize some kind of real value function. But with the, this confidence, we're able to express the fact that if someone click on an item, it's a strong positive feedback. But if you didn't click or didn't view this, this, for example, this article, which was displayed on the front page, we should give it a negative feedback, but slightly less. The other very strong point is in order to train this model, there's what's called the alternating least square algorithm, which is uh, fast and embarrassing, well, which is fast and distributed because it, it's broken down into two parts. So first, well, every step you train the user factors and the item factors, and when you train the user factors, you're able to parallelize um, the, the training of each individual user factor, and so you're able to do this in, on a cluster of nodes. Problem is, there are no very elegant way to add metadata. So if you know something from your user, such as the gender or the location, and similarly on the content, if you know what's the genre of a movie, there are no clean way to incorporate this information into ALS. There are ways, but they're hacky. That's a problem because in a real world setting, we face a huge churn of users, so constantly new users coming into the system for which we know very little, and ALS doesn't lend very well to predict for these users. That's what we call the call start in the literature. And we can have call start for users as well as for items. For example, currently I work on, me, on news recommendations. What do you do when you have a new article for which no one has uh, read or clicked? You have to rely on metadata, on topics, on the road text, on the category, on the author, whatnot. But you can't purely use clicks on this particular item to. Uh, to um, infer the factors for this, uh, this particular piece of content. One improvement that was published by Spotify is to, well, first make the model a bit more elegant by turning, well, still using a cross product of user and item factors, so XI and YI. I think there's a typo, it should be XU and YU. Turn this into a binary click prediction by um, making the cross products, adding biases for user and items, and then slapping a um, sigmoid function to turn the logits, logits into a, a, a probability. So being closer to what we are trying to predict, which is click. Using NumPy, the inference for this model is uh, very elegantly described. So you see we have kind of a direct mapping between the formula above and the NumPy code, which is to do the dot product of users, adding the biases, and then applying the logits. By using NumPy um, vector ability, the, way, the ability to, to work not only for a single user, but to work on a matrix of, of users, and by using the broadcasting, 
we are able to just, by one-liner, express this, this complex formula. That's great. But in order to train the algorithm, well, we need to derive the gradients manually. So we need to do this uh, math uh, computation. We need to implement it in NumPy. That gets a bit more verbose, a bit more dirty. And I don't really expect you to read the, the, <laughs> the code. It's just an example to say that, yes, inference is, is simple, but deriving the training algorithm is, less, is much more verbose. And we have also to take care of the gradient step. So we know the gradients, but how much we move whenever we do an epoch of training. That has, we have to, to pick a strategy, which can be add a grade, for example, but that has to be manually written in kind of very imperative uh, NumPy code. And personally, it's something I've never really felt uh, comfortable doing. Like, I feel I should be building machine learning algorithm with the higher level abstractions. Scikit-learn is great, but I can't, for example, reach this, this level of um, granularity. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to use these variations of, uh, of recommender systems, but at the same time, uh, we work in a company that can be a small startup, a small company. I don't have time or don't have the confidence to make sure this formula is correct. I don't want to spend some time uh, scratching my head, thinking why, does, why the algorithm doesn't, doesn't converge. Is it because of my implementation, because of my data? Uh, that's, I would like to have I would like to be on, on the safe side uh, with respect to the tools I use. And this is why I think this picture, well, being French and being uh, born in Normandy, uh, this was a truly uh, liberation for me when, the, when I discovered the, the symbolic computing and the auto-differentiation that all the deep learning frameworks come with. So I'm not talking specifically about TensorFlow here, uh, Torch, Theano, um, Chainer, they all have this, this ability that you describe the inference part of your, your algorithm and the rest kind of comes for free with the caveats, obviously. So the inference step, first uh, glance, much more verbose than in, in NumPy, but, and that's actually quite a uh, often um, heard reproach about TensorFlow, very verbose, but actually most of it is boilerplate code around scoping. And if we look um, closely, we see that we have the same building blocks as in NumPy. So we have the embedding lookup. It's equivalent to the, the slicing we were using in NumPy. So based on a batch of user IDs, we'll be looking, we'll be looking in the, the factors matrix for the, the rows of these user IDs. Same for the biases. And then we have the item product, which is uh, somewhere just a matrix multiplication of the factors together, the addition of uh, biases. So verbose, but very de declarative, kind of bug, well, less error prone, I would say. It's just declaring your model. Still kind of a, a direct mapping with the, the math formula. But what I prefer to, to look at is actually from this declarative um, code, Using the tensor board, you're able to visualize the computational graph that is created from these declarations. So we can see X and Y are the, the embeddings of user and items, the biases B and C. And so we declare the graph, it's compiled, and then at runtime, what we'll do is feed data into the graph through the, uh, the placeholders. So for, for example, for a user one, we'll pick the row in the embedding X, we'll have so X user, same for the item, we'll do the dot product, add the biases, and then compute the logits, apply the sigmoid, and then compare with the, the, the ratings. Well, actually, the ratings, they should be binary because we are computing a log loss. And what's magical is once you've defined the inference part of your model, it's kind of plug and play. You just define in a very, in a short uh, piece of code, in a, a one-liner, you define, well, on top of your log loss, you define what should be the, um, what should be the optimizer, what should be the algorithm for stochastic gradient descent. So it can be Adam, it can be um, Ada grade, it can be many variants, but that's really plug and play. It doesn't, I don't have to touch the, um, this code based on the optimizer I pick. 
I can choose as well what, what loss. If I'm willing to do rating prediction, I can plug a mean squared error loss without touching the rest, the bottom part of my code. And based on the optimizer, based on the cost function, you see that attached here we have that the, the framework will derive uh, if I have an error of x on the top part, then I need to back propagate this error to, to um, the weights of the, um, the, the parameters of the model. And this is all done internally. I don't have to write this back propagation step. I already mentioned the flexibility, and that's exactly this. So once you have this kind of simple model, just uh, using simple factors for user IDs and item IDs, well, it's very trivial to say, well, what if I wanted to actually not only consider the user ID, but also the features of this user? And that's what this article is doing. It's, it's saying, so the key formula is here. It's saying, I want to consider the user not only using a vector uh, specific to this user, but I also want to say, well, let's take into account the embedding for the genre, the embedding for the age, and so forth. And so the final representation of a user is the sum of the embeddings of uh, it, his features or her features. And the same on the item side. And then we just do the classical dot product. Just a very simple variant of matrix factorization. But that enables us to feed, um, to take into account uh, features. So very important because seamlessly at recommendation time, for um, users that have a lot of history, we'll be able to use their specific embeddings. But if we have a new user, we'll be able to actually reconstruct a profile solely based on the, um, the metadata. And if we have someone in between, well, we'll use a mix of features and past actions, um, the, the factors learned on the past actions. One interesting um, extension is to turn the recommendation problem from a binary prediction into a multi-class classification, actually an extreme multi-class classification where we're trying to, uh, on the top of our neural network, try to have a, uh, a fan out, try to predict the probability of all the possible items the, the, the user can next consume. And so something really akin to word to vec uh, which has been developed on the, this paper, Deep Neural Networks for YouTube Rex. So it's a, I see, well, it's just the last layer of the network is a softmax that fans out towards all possible next videos a user can watch, similarly to word to vec But the bottom part of the network is a deep neural network where we're able to feed um, not only the user features, but also the past interactions. And that's a key key idea of this uh, paper, which was actually also developed in the SVD++ model from the Net Netflix prize, but it's um, reintroduced here in a neural network um, formal, uh, formalism. So for every sample in our data set, we're trying to predict the watch, the so WT, based on the history of not only watches, but also search history. So really flexible framework where you can uh, feed various signals into your system. And this is a kind of simple uh, example of such a system where based on uh, my data sets, actually I haven't covered this, but this is the movie lens uh, 1 million data set. So ratings of, uh, of uh, movies from users, but I'm turning this into a more realistic setting by uh, bin binarizing the, the, um, the ratings and I'm trying to predict what is the next movie people will watch and enjoy. And so with this network, it's, it's not shallow anymore because we are combining factors for the users as we've described before in the, the first architecture. And we're also feeding uh, factors or embeddings for the user based on the past history. So this is a representation of the user solely based on the past uh, movies this user liked. And because, and because we might want to use different size of embeddings for the history and for the features, we can't directly do a cross product of these, these data. So we use the flexibility of neural networks by just concatenating and having just a tensor 
uh, based on the, the, the embedding of the user based on the features and the past history, concatenate these, uh, these, these data together, and then applying um, a non-linear layer to compute the final representation of the user. Another interesting bit of this uh, idea is that actually inputs that are solely based on the user. So from there, it's all depending on the user, so uh, past history, features, and it's only at the topmost layer that, like we do in word 2 vec we have embeddings of uh, output items. So why is it important? It's because, and this is the similar architecture, the full architecture from the, um, the neural network uh, for YouTube paper. So the final output of the model is actually just the user representation, which are non-linear combinations of history, searches, geolocation, gender, age, all information about the user. We condense this into a single, uh, single vector that we th then compare to the item embeddings, the video vectors, by doing the cross product. And in real time, what we do is we don't feed data into this complex neural network. What we do is we just use the embeddings, the computed embeddings. We store them in a some kind of database with the nearest neighbor index, and we turn the recommendation problem into a search problem. We say, I have a user, or I have, um, for example, features of a user. I will pick the representations uh, of these features or, or of this user in the last uh, layer, and I will look in this latent space um, items that are close by in this latent space. And this is a very fast and efficient way to retrieve quickly candidates for, for recommendations. I'm going to demonstrate this using the TensorBoard um, embedding visualizer, which is a, a tool to visualize such embeddings. The key is these embeddings, they are typically uh, of dimension 10 to 100 or thousands, so not very easy to visualize them. PCA is one way to, to reduce the dimensionality, but TensorBoard comes also with a TSNE, which is a, um, a better way to compress, um, to visualize latent space of high dimensionality into a two-dimensional 2D or 3D visualization. It's better because it tends to, to create clusters of, um, of points that are close together in the original space. So here we have each point is a movie for which we have the genre. So it's not so clear, but we have on the bottom right, we have, uh, I think, drama and uh, yeah, drama and romance. On the left part, we have uh, sci-fi and horror. And at recommendation time, let's say we have a user for which we know nothing except it's a male and very stereotypic, stereotypically, we'll pick uh, near this, the embedding of the, the gender male, we have very manly movies such as Goldfinger, Full Metal Jacket, and so forth. Yeah, lots of stereotypes. Because for women, we'll have, well, typical uh, romance uh, comedy, which actually more of my taste, but so <laughs> that's a starting point. Uh, what's interesting is that we have the same for the age, and we can combine those. So if we have as a heuristic, if we have information about the gender and the age, then we could do just the sum, the average of these two embeddings and look for something in between. And more interestingly, for example, if your last um, viewed movie was something independent, something that doesn't tie to any stereotypes, then seamlessly we would construct some kind of hybrid representation of this user made of uh, the, the features and the last uh, item seen to very efficiently retrieve candidates. So we have really a kind of seamless model to tackle cold start recommendations from, um, but also incorporating uh, views. And as, as, as you view more and more movies, we're able to refine your profile. Usually, this uh, step is just a pre-candidate selection. There's another architecture to more uh, finely uh, predict if you to actually do the ranking. So we use this fast method to quickly retrieve candidates, and then there's another architecture that is uh, trained to uh, rank the final list to be a display to the user. Um, so as a conclusion, well, for me it's 
these deep learning frameworks have been really a uh, addition on top of the existing uh, ecosystem of uh, TensorFlow, and that really solved uh, this problem of, I want to re-implement something from the literature, but as a applied data scientist working in a company, uh, I don't really have time to debug the, the math or very complex gradient descent uh, code, which is very error prone. We need to have some, some better abstractions to work. And, well, I think that's really where TensorFlow is, um, is good, is I want also to have some guarantee when it comes to training, scaling, and deployment. And these are tools I haven't really covered today because that's a whole separate talks, but it's clear that TensorFlow and uh, with the, the backup of Google is really not only providing you the, the core blocks to build your model, but also the, the, the scaffolding to then deploy it, train it in an efficient manner. To be honest, I've only scratched the surface of what's possible in terms of um, building recommender systems. There are many interesting uh, approaches, such as instead of using the log loss or the cross entropy loss, we could actually uh, learn to rank, so directly training our models, um, trying to, to minimize a cost function based on the actual list you recommend, and not just a pointwise uh, loss. There are also wide and deep recommenders, a very good um, tutorial uh, visible where we kind of have a model which is a mix of logistic regression, which is widely used, for example, in computational advertisement with a deep uh, part that uses embeddings. And this model, this hybrid model, is uh, trained uh, in combination. So you have really a hybrid model that is trained in a one pipeline. And the last... Um, the last kind of architecture that uh, I'm actually investiga investigating currently is how to incorporate um, time into the mix, how to incorporate the sequence of actions that the user has previously uh, followed. And this very interesting paper does this by take, taking into account, well, user and time features as well as actions. And even more interestingly, it's able to do recommendations of predicting the next action or the next content you will consume, but also when the user will uh, come back. So it's tackling churn and recommendation into a single uh, architecture, which is uh, jointly trained. Um, and this should be, well, uh, I'm not gonna, going to say fairly easy, but using the deep learning frameworks, it should be, um, you have already the building blocks to, to build such architecture. And for example, the LSTM cell, which is a recurrent neural network cell, will be able to, um, yeah, it's available as a kind of plug in in these, uh, these frameworks. That's it uh, for today. Thank you for listening to the talk. And if you have any questions. Thank you very much. This was a fantastic talk. I uh, have two questions. Uh, first one would be great to see some comparison of uh, a ALS and this method and what's the improvement using this con uh, features, user features, not, not, only, uh, mm. not only ratings. Second question is more basic. When you do this classifier, you need to have uh, a sample so you use, so how would you build a sample? Uh, you probably would use users and some target if he clicks or not, but like if he not clicked, what would you include in this sample? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so two. Um Two good uh, questions. In terms of a uh, benchmark, it's uh, something I wanted to, <laughs> to, to do, uh, but I didn't have uh, quite enough time. I, I did some offline calculation, but the um, problem is, especially with the recommender systems, where in the end you would like to op optimize some online metrics. So you'd like to do an A-B test and measure that you're improving uh, click-through rate or ideally engagement. And it's quite non-trivial to express uh, this as a offline uh, benchmark. And in reality, many papers I see published in the area, they make how you define your offline evolution will, uh, is, is quite um, biased. Well, by doing so, you, you basically how much user without metadata you have. If you have lots of, uh, if you have a very sparse interaction matrix, then features that will be very important. But if, if you don't, for example, in the, the classic uh, movie lens on Netflix, they have only users with at least 10 ratings. And in this case, yes, very, 
for 10 ratings, you might all actually always prefer to use, not use the features, but use the clicks. Um, so, yeah, so it's hard to have a uh, offline benchmark, which is really representative of the, what you're trying to do online. But I, I'm working on, on this. And what I expect is to see that for a few clicks, or for a very, if you don't have much information, then features are important. And then as soon as you have more clicks, ALS is probably possibly um, performing as, as well as the, the shallow architecture. And what I'd like to see as well is, well, what I've seen is the, the depth of the network is, is based on the how heterogeneous are your features. If you have only one type of feature, then going deep is not really interesting. But if you're combining history plus uh, user features plus uh, searches, then that's when the stacking the, the, the non-linear layers uh, comes uh, as, a, as a benefit. But definitely, practically, in reality, you want to start simple. Because, because of this, you might overfit offline and realize your very complex, fancy, deep uh, network is actually doing something very stupid online by, uh, because it's capturing some features that are not available live. That happens quite a lot. So in practice, is test something shallow, test it online. And then once you have some kind of feeling that your offline metrics is well correlated with the online metrics, then you, you go for the, um, the, the depth and the, um, yeah. And the second question was... Uh, How you construct samples for... Yeah. yeah. So either you, do, you have explicit uh, impressions. For example, this user was displayed with uh, these five recommendations. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to capture some bias uh, of the position. Possibly the topmost recommendations is most, most often clicked. But then you discount this positional bias. <coughs> and then you feed these as direct binary uh, targets. If you don't, then you, you use negative sampling. So uh, very similarly to word to vec where you, you can't, if you, if you have a softmax layer on the last term, you can't compute the, the denominator. You don't want to compute the denominator, which involves computing the scores for every possible candidate items. What you do is you pick one positive and then 10 negatives. And this is also quite tricky because depending on how you pick the negative samples, that could affect how well you will perform online. Any other questions? I was expecting a question about uh, TensorFlow versus a PyTorch. So if <laughs> anyone wants to ask it. Um, <laughs> what's TensorFlow like compared to PyTorch? No. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you use TensorFlow to serve your models live, or are you just using it here to train these things, and then you're using something else for live? So, so currently, we don't use it live, because it's quite a, uh, engineering-wise, engineering it's a, quite a, a bit of work. So what we do is we pre-compute uh, factors or embeddings for, for features, for specifically for users, and we try to use this idea to so turn the recommendation as a search problem. So there's actually this afternoon, there's a very interesting talk about using Elasticsearch for uh, recommendations that I will uh, plan to attend because that's what we're trying to, to, to develop. So, well, the first approach is just to pre-compute recommendations for you. We, we know you're an active user, so we'll kind of baked uh, 10 or, well, no, 100 of uh, candidates, but that doesn't scale very well if you have a large set of items or if you have a lot of churn. So the second step is to turn recommendation as a search problem. And the last, last step is to do real-time scoring. And we are kind of in the middle in practice. Thank you. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Yeah, how do you construct those embeddings? So the embeddings are actually uh, trained as part of the, um, uh, these representations of, um, of a, for example, past, past uh, items that are parameters of the models. So you, it's like a blank slate that you initialize randomly, but thanks to the backpropagation, as you feed examples, the error will backpropagate, and these embeddings, they will converge, they will self-organize based on your, your target. That's kind of the, the magic of uh, matrix factorization, works on a similar idea, actually. So you just say, well, I want to model my user as a 10 or well, 100 dimension uh, vector and same of the items, please 
uh, organize yourself so that um, I'm able to, to explain what movie you will like and what movie you will dislike. And what's interesting is even if you don't use any um, metadata, you when you inspect your embeddings, you see that there are uh, correlations. You see that actually the network has used maybe a few coordinates to model um, gender or to model genre. So you see that it's learning in a very unsupervised way your features. But obviously, if you're able to feed these features as well, it's like speed up the, the learning. But it's, yeah, it's really uh, learned by the model, the embeddings. There are coefficients, there are weights of the model. Have more questions? So, probably, I, I really wanted to ask TensorFlow versus PyTorch. Yeah, if you really want to answer, please answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, the actually it's good because it's uh, I don't want to to pretend to be a fanboy of a TensorFlow. I think TensorFlow shines because of the the all the tools they're build, building on top, well, or side next to um, to TensorFlow. But the declaration, the code declaration, is uh, static. So it's really, you, def you define your model using a kind of DSL where you have the tf.add, tf.multiplication, tf.slice, so kind of replicating the capacities of NumPy. You declare your network, and that doesn't look like, it looks, it's Python, but it looks very kind of artificial. It's lazily computed, so you do actually nothing. And then finally, you, you run the data into your compiled graph. So graph statically compiled, Whereas using a kind of DSL, whereas PyTorch is dynamically compiled, so it's much more, uh, you, you're able to embed or mix uh, NumPy and pure Python and PyTorch code in a uh, seamlessly. So on this, I think uh, PyTorch has a, feels a bit more natural to, to code and it feels it's slightly better integrated to the ecosystem. However, both are using, are accepting NumPy arrays as inputs. I think. I'm quite uh, interested to, to look more into uh, PyTorch. But currently, it doesn't have the, um, the level of support or the, the additional goodies that uh, TensorFlow has. Well, thank you very much, Gillian. If anyone else has a question, so I'm sure that uh, Gillian will be around to answer them. And give a warm round of applause again.